On April 24, 1990, NASA launched Space Shuttle Discovery on mission STS-31 to deliver the Hubble Space Telescope to low Earth orbit. While this was the 31st mission funded for the Space Shuttle, it was the 35th mission actually launched. While all shuttle missions were delayed by the loss of Challenger in 1986, this mission in particular had been put off because the company contracted to shape the Hubble main mirror, Perkin Elmer, constantly shifted their schedule and went over budget. But finally, six years after its initial scheduled launch time, it was ready to go, and here we have the crew. It was a morning launch, so the crew got suited up before dawn. All members of the crew had been to space before. The commander for the mission was Lauren Schreiber, who you see here, who is currently Deputy Director for Launch and Payload Processing at the KSC. The pilot for the mission, who we'll see next here, is Charlie Bolden. And he became NASA Administrator in 2009 and continues to be NASA Administrator as I record this video in 2015. Catherine Sullivan was an EVA specialist for the mission. She had been the first American woman to perform a spacewalk in 1984 and is currently the Administrator of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Bruce McCandless would join Sullivan if an EVA became necessary, and he made the first ever untethered EVA using the manned maneuvering unit in 1984. Last but not least is Stephen Hawley, who was tasked to operate the Canadarm, the remote manipulator system to pull Hubble out of the cargo bay. He's currently a professor of physics and astronomy in the University of Kansas. So as they get ready to go, we'll be listening in to a selection from the mission audio, but one thing they do not know at this point is that the main mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope is misshapen. Perkin Elmer had miscalibrated one of the instruments that was supposed to test its shape, and in fact it will produce blurry images until a further space shuttle mission to service the Hubble will install a correct mirror. Now this is the first shuttle mission I'm covering for Today in Space History, so I decided to put a little bit more of the prologue to the launch into this video. T minus seven minutes, 30 seconds and counting. CLSS go for orbiter access arm retract. This arm can be re-extended in less than half a minute if that's necessary. May upon T minus five minutes and counting. CLSS go for orbiter APU start. And we have a go for APU start. APU please. They apparently had a lot of trouble with those APUs, the auxiliary power units, which aren't actually auxiliary power units. They are actually essential power units for the shuttle, but they constantly had trouble with those, apparently. The gimbling of the main engines is complete, and the aerosurfaces have been verified that they are positioned for launch. Standing by now for a go for auto sequence start. T minus 33. What has happened is the ground launch sequencer would not hand off to the orbiter's computers to complete the count because the liquid oxygen fill and drain valve was showing off when it should be on. There's the confirmation that we have successfully Recycle. We are go for start. Booster hydraulic power units have started. Sound suppression water system has started. T minus 13 seconds. T minus 10, go for main engine start. We are go for main engine start. T minus 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Mission Control Houston. Roll program. Roger roll, Discovery. The roll maneuver puts the vehicle in the proper launch plane. Guidance officer confirms a good roll maneuver. Engine's now throttling back.
The throttle down maneuver assists in reducing the aerodynamic loads on Discovery as it passes through the area of not maximum dynamic pressure. Velocity now 1,200 feet per second. Discovery downrange three nautical miles. Discovery, go and throttle up. All three engines now throttle back up. Go and throttle up. Engines at 104 percent. The go at throttle up call signifies that all systems are performing well. All three auxiliary power units look good. Discovery's velocity now 2,300 feet per second, and is downrange eight nautical miles. Standing by for SRB separation. And both solid rocket boosters have separated. Discovery's velocity now 4,300 feet per second at a downrange distance of 35 nautical miles. We'll cut from the original audio as the shuttle makes its way to orbit. This was a very high orbit for the shuttle to reach, 615 kilometers by 585 kilometers, and the further servicing missions, which had to rendezvous with Hubble, were right at the edge of the shuttle's capabilities. It is important to remember that the shuttle's main engines, which you see firing here, do not restart. They do not operate without the external tank attached. They're not balanced for that. To make orbit, the shuttle uses its small orbital maneuvering system engines, the OMS engines or OMS engines, mounted on the pods next to the vertical stabilizer. Uh, those are weak but reliable engines designed to be relit. And we'll see the main engines cut out here, and then soon the external tank release, and the RCS system, the, and then the OMS engines will help it to maneuver away from the external tank. The six-year delay in this mission meant that there was already a lot of tension going into it. Add to that the criticism of NASA for the budget overruns, and on top of that the reputational hit produced by the Challenger disaster, and this was already a high-stakes mission with a great deal of public attention. Uh, a bit more on the lens issue that would turn this otherwise successful mission into another blow to NASA. Here you can see a comparison of the blurry picture Hubble returned after this mission, and to its right, an image of the same galaxy, M100, after it got the corrective lens in STS-61. Incidentally, Perk and Elmer basically paid back their fees for shaping the mirror in order to avoid a lawsuit. Discover Houston. You have a go to open the doors. Uh, Roger, Houston. Houston, Discover. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, Ox, you guys can probably see it. Looks like uh, that Ox Deucer on the left domes is uh, kind of getting noisy and it's tripping the, the uh, caution and warning. Roger that. Stand by, Charlie. We're talking about it. Uh, no action for you right yet. And this is Mission Control Houston at three hours, two minutes into the flight of Discovery. Uh, we're now seeing uh, payload bay views from camera A. That's on the forward bulkhead of Discovery looking aft. Discovery Houston, we're getting some real good payload bay television downlink and we see that Steve has been hard at work getting the RMS deployed. This is Mission Control. Uh, Mission Specialist Steve Hawley uh, continuing to take the uh, RMS through its uh, checkout procedures. We are looking at the end effector as it is run through the uh, snare drive test. The uh, end effector will be used uh, to grapple the uh, Hubble Space Telescope tomorrow and uh, will be used to release the telescope. Morning, Story. Good morning, Discovery. Good morning from Bill Reeves and Orbit One team, and you got a go for HST deploy ops. That's outstanding. Thank you. Sure is. Our PDRS officer here in the flight control room confirms uh, via telemetry that uh, 
The Hubble Space Telescope has been grappled. Okay, so I don't know how to use the Canada Arm yet, the RMS, the Remote Manipulator System, which the shell uses to pull the Hubble out of the bay. And in general, my own attempt at deployment was a fiasco. I somehow lost the solar panels on Hubble. They'll have some solar panel issues as well, but not as bad as mine. Uh, but let's just take a look at how they did it uh, uh, close up. It's probably better that way. You know, pitch is uh, about four degrees off, attitude-wise. Okay. Um, maybe that's what make, what's making it look like that. You're going to pitch it up? Okay. I see you coming up. How does it look out your window as far as clearance? Because that's the only thing oh, you can't see. I can't see out your window either. Um, that show us about two inches starboard. Good clearance. Still looks good. And the... Uh, It's about an inch forward, but I think that may be pitch. Pitch again kind of yeah. sagged. It's 355 right now. It sure looks like I want to go to starboard. Starboard, yeah. I'd go ahead and do it. Because you got. Over here, I, I can see uh, lots of clearance. Coming starboard nicely. Charlie coming in over your shoulder. A little bit more. Okay, still coming. Okay. What's my uh, Z? Okay, Z is minus 538. And it's coming up nicely. Okay, and then here we have the antennae on Hubble extending here very, very slowly. You already see that the booms carrying the solar panels were out, and here the solar panel, one of the solar panels is being unfurled. I believe there's the, well, there's the port side solar panel. The reason it's so slow is to avoid too much tension, and that's got to be important for the starboard side solar panel, as we'll soon see. Discovery used. more and more like an uh, orbit 20 release. We'd like you to press on with the EVA prep. Okay, we copy. If you recall, two members of the crew, Catherine Sullivan and Bruce McCandless, were to be prepared to go out on EVA just in case they had to fix something with Hubble before it was released into space. And so here they are getting prepared just in case they need to go out. Houston, uh, Charlie's Downstairs in the process of getting uh, Bruce and Kathy buttoned up in the suits. EVA copies, and we're watching the fans come on. They proceeded to unfurl the starboard side solar panel, and then... Houston Discovery, it looks like motion stopped with uh, just about one panel showing. And we see that too, Lauren. The DCE is off. Now they have a limited amount of time, about 12 minutes, to decide whether to send the EVA pair, which is already prepped, out to EVA in order to crank out the solar panel manually. And that's because the Hubble is on internal power right now, and it really needs the solar panel open in order to recharge prior to going onto the dark side of the planet. So they need to try and see whether it's safe to go out on EVA or whether they need to. And here comes a, an awkward moment of tension in a mission control. The other thing I need an answer to is if I can go ahead and commit the EVA with a thought of going out and cranking it out. If, the, if whatever they're about to do fails, do they want us to just press on to back them up? We need to get on with it. Okay, flight, I'll come back with the answer. And I need answers now. Flight, I fail. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't feel comfortable waiting until after I don't either. That's why I want the answers now. Yeah, 620 is the, my drop dead time from adding up all the times. Okay, I'm going to have them press on. All right, Capcom, tell the crew we want them to press on into EVA, and Flight. we'll stop them whenever we have to. 
We've got the DCE back on. We're going to disable the tension monitoring and resend the proc to deploy the minus SDM. Okay. I think the situation here was that the detector for tension was preventing it from unfurling and they just needed to disable that in order to allow it to unfurl and so an EVA was not necessary. Okay, Houston, we see motion. We've got the image down here, Lauren. At Houston, we think it stopped. It's fully deployed. The micro switch is confirming. Okay. And for Bruce and Kathy, we'd like you to stop the airlock depress at 5, please. Okay, and just for amusement, here's how my own deployment of the Space tele Telescope turned out. Uh, just used a regular decoupler in Kerbal Space Program, uh, couldn't use the arm. And in the corner there you see the proper Space Telescope floating away from this Space Shuttle. But here I deployed it, unfortunately. Uh, the solar panels are on there, I just couldn't figure out how to deploy them. Uh, go figure. Or, or the antennae for that matter. Well, the work of STS-31 and its crew wasn't done just with Hubble. They had other experiments to run and did some weather reporting. We're getting TV down here. Is that lightning that you see down there? That is extreme lightning. That's correct. Boy, you bet. CCTVs. I've never seen them pick it up like that. The way one of the experiments they did was described had me a little bit worried, but then I looked it up and it turned out just to be a protein crystal growth experiment, but uh, here's how it was transmitted initially on their broadcast. This is something like eight TV tests at once. There's a, a, a certain toxin on each one of those sets of tines, and the idea is to determine whether the bodies response to uh, immune system response varies at all in zero G. Uh, some of the body's immune response of course is governed by the, the blood system and another level of it is controlled uh, by the cellular structure of the body and the objective of this experiment specifically was to look at cell mediated immune response. That still sounds a little bit worrying to me. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how alarmed I should be by that particular experiment. But anyway, here we have the shuttle bay doors closing and I have not mastered the ability to land the space shuttle in this case at Edwards Air Force Base uh, so I'm just gonna have to go with the original footage on that we uh, have a sighting discovery on the long-range optics from De Vandenberg Air Force Base Discovery's velocity now Mach 6 altitude 133,000 feet 181 miles away from Edwards Discover Houston, state vector transfer to the BFS, please. Transfer in work. Discovery now at 14,000 feet, making the final approach, lining up over runway 22. One little point of interest is that the space shuttle cannot actually retract its landing gear. It has three ways to deploy the landing gear and they all operate at once, but it can't retract them in order to save mass. They didn't want to put all the systems to actually pull the landing gear back up. Landing gear is down and locked. Gear touchdown. Nose gear touchdown. While it would take three more years before the real fruits of this mission could be realized, Hubble did eventually give us a new eye on the universe as promised. The Hubble Space Telescope has produced virtually all of the beautiful images of the deep cosmos we use as desktop wallpapers, and more importantly, has led to a vast amount of scientific research. Anyone can apply to use the telescope, and thousands of peer-reviewed papers in scientific journals are a direct result of the data it has provided. 
Thanks for watching this episode of Today in Space History for April 24th, STS-31 and the deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope. Special thanks to Dragon-01 for the component space shuttle and Yogui-87 for the model of the Hubble Space Telescope.